and welcome to another Turi mock interview series. I am Jose, a tech lead at Turi, and I'm from Montreal, Canada. And today I will be interviewing Raul Kumar Das for the role of an experienced Android developer. Okay. And the, the question that you might see today might be different if you come to a Turi interview. Okay. You might get junior, middle, and senior questions at the same interview. Let's get started. So, first of all, How are you doing and how is your day doing so far? Uh, I'm doing great. Thanks for asking and talking about my day. I just woke up with a few new notifications about new tasks I have been assigned for, you know, for this remote job, which I've been working with for start because their time zone is different than mine. So by the time I wake up, they have already worked two hours. So yeah, I got those tasks and now just finish them. So yeah, feeling great. So far, good. Yeah, that is interesting. All right. Okay. Uh, thanks for sharing. And could you please uh, introduce yourself and tell me a little bit about your background, okay, your professional experience? Then I'll take from there. Yeah, sure. So uh, I am basically from Jharkhand, India, and I have done my graduation in computer science in 2017. Since then only I have uh, moved to a software in developer. I have been working in Android development. I have around uh, five, more than five years of experience in Android application development, both mobile as well as Android TV platform. Nice. That was, that was really great. All right. Um, okay. And you mentioned that you work in for Android and mobile, right? And for Android TV as well. Could you please tell me uh, yeah, yeah. a little bit more about some interesting uh, Android push that you have been work on? Sure. So as I started my journey with Android development, initially I worked with an NGO company in India, which was related to health, uh, you know, health application. So actually that, uh, that company was tied up with Rajasthan government in here, that was the state government. Okay, and I worked on the project where they were trying to collect the MCHN data, which is maternal child health data. So basically, I developed an application which was completely offline, and it was tracking their data, uh, providing them, you know, health notifications, their due list updates, and stuff like that. And uh, it was also automatically sending the report to government so that they can take action, you know, whenever they see that some women or some child is in high risk. So that was the first project I worked with. And then I joined another organization uh, named Sido.tv, which was completely on OTT, you know, OTT player. Like, so I worked in the, uh, in that company, I worked with StarHub, which was an Android TV application, uh, basically in Singapore, that was a telecom company. And then I worked with Tata Sky, that was again a telecom giant in India. And that was also in Android TV box only. Right, so those two OTT, platform which I worked when I worked with the CEDO. Then now, right now, I'm working with Disney Hotstar and developing their application, which is Hotstar itself. Nice. So yeah, I mean, all these projects which I've worked, it's great. Yeah, yeah. That. it definitely is great. All right. Okay, and let's now talk about Android, okay? Um, how can two distinct Android apps uh, interact? There are various ways to interact with distinct Android application. At the simplest level, two different applications may interact via intents by passing data from one application to another or by services where one application provides functionality to use the, you know, other to use. So yeah, these are the two basic ways which in which uh, two applications, two Android applications can interact. But on the top of it, there are several other ways also which they can use, like they can use content providers to, you know, share data across different applications. Uh, they can use uh, broadcasts and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, they can use databases to share data between one another. So yeah, there are various ways, gotcha. but the most common are the one which I mentioned earlier. Yeah. All right. Great, great, great. Okay. Uh, next question is, okay. Um, how would you describe the difference between uh, services in Android? Yeah. So basically um, service in, is an Android component. You no, know, that that is used to perform long running applications in the background and without providing a user interface. It can run in the background even when the user is not interacting with your application. So there are basically three types of services in Android. First is foreground service. A foreground service, uh, you know, performs some operation that is 
noticeable to user for example when we use a program service to you know play an audio track or something gotcha. and then there is background services a background services performs an operation that is indirectly noticed by a uh, user so uh, after api level 26 android restricted the you know use of background services because it consumes battery too much so if you want to perform background running services uh, it is recommended to use you know work manager and okay. then the third type is bound services so basically bound services is you know services which i was mentioning again in the previous question which is used to you know basically interact with two applications mm-hmm. so basically uh, when they want to interact with you know other other service they need to bind this service and it works as a client server architecture basis got you so yeah i mean those are the yeah Those are the three types of services. Okay, and previously, previously we talked about how two applications can uh, interact, right? But when it comes to fragments, okay, um, how would you communicate between two fragments? So again, like uh, fragments can also you know interact in various ways, and the most common way, uh, way which how they can interact is using the hosted. Applic- hosted activity which they are you know contained in, so they can uh, you know share data using some in- with the help of some interfaces where the uh, the the host application implements an interface which is used by both the application and the in- fragments when they wanted to share some data they can just uh, call that inter- interface method and activity can listen to those methods and transfer the data to the next fragment. That is the most common way. Okay. If we do not talk about any architecture, but but if we talk about uh, this architecture mvvm if we are following that which is a recommended architecture in android we can use the shared view model concept where uh, both the fragments can uh, you know use the shared view model and with the help of live data they can you know transfer the data with the help of you know data flow where one fragment update the data and the other fragment can just observe the data flow and you know update their whatever ui or whatever needed Thank you. And uh, as we are talking about fragments, okay, what are retained fragments? Okay, so uh, as, a, as a, whenever whenever the an orientation changes or configuration changes happen in an Android application system, uh, the system by like by default it destroys the current activity and all the over like the lying fragment on top of it and then recreates them, right? But if by some reason you want to retain those fragment and do not want to be destroyed when this configuration changes happens like when like let's say user rotated the screen and the configuration change at the time you do not want to you know destroy the fragment we can set a signal in the fragment itself by set return state true and by telling it to the system it will now retain that fragment and it won't destroy so you know when we do that that is called a retained fragment all right and move on Okay. Uh, what are the permission protection levels in Android? So, based on the required permission requested by the uh, application, there are four types of uh, protection level. First of them is very normal, where uh, it does not require any user's approval to, you know, provide for uh, to that does not require user permission to, you know, grant permission to those like you know internet internet permission, which can be normally granted by just declaring in the manifest. Then there are dangerous permission where uh, application seeks some data which might uh, require user's attention, and for that only it you know explicitly requires user's permission to uh, manually provide grant. Then only it can be provided, like camera or you know file system. Then there are signature permissions. A signature permissions is only provided to the application whose signature matches with the what is declared in the their manifest. Gotcha. And it the signature permission also you know signature permission also does not require any user's explicit approval. Then there is signature or system permission, where again it it is granted by the system to the system image uh, you know applications like uh, when the battery level changes or the network changes happen, it is only granted to the system permission system application or the so yeah those are the you know system or uh, signature or system permission. Okay, great. So yeah, these are the four types. Nice. All right, and move on. My next question is: uh, What is the view holder pattern, 
and why should we use it? So every time when the adapters call get view method, the find view by ID method is also called. This is very intensive work for the mobile CPU and so affects the performance of the application and the battery consumption increases. View holder is a design pattern that can be uh, you know applied as a way around the repeated use of the find view ID. A view holder holds the reference to the ID of the view resource and calls the resource will not be required after you find them. Thus, the performance of the application increases. So basically, whenever uh, a same view is required by the uh, you know by the view, it does not create a new view. It just checks if the same view is available in the view holder pool. It just uses them, and yeah, it basically uses the same view. Okay. Got you. Next question. Uh, what's the difference between compile SDK version and target SDK version? So the compile SDK version is the version of the API the app is compiled against. You know, this means you can use Android API features included in that version, as well as all previous version, like obviously. If you, and if you try to use an API feature, like if you try to use API 16 feature, but set compile SDK version to 15, you, know, you, you will get compilation error because you know you have not targeted that, I mean, you have not used that compilation version. So you need to use uh, API 16 only to use you know all the 16 uh, features as well as the previous features. Now that is the compiled SDK version. Now target SDK version has nothing to do with how your app is compiled or what API you can utilize. The target SDK version is supposed to indicate that you have tested your app on the you know the 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 version you specify this is more like a certification or sign off you are giving the android OS that that how it should handle your app in terms of os feature so basically when you are mentioning a target SDK version it will be running up to that targeted uh, application mm -hmm. smoothly without breaking any feature nice all right and my next yeah. question next question is what's the difference between array map and uh, hash map. Array map is a generic key value mapping data structure that is designed to be you know more efficient than a traditional Java hash map. It keeps its mapping in an array data structure, an integer array of hash codes for each item, and an object array in the key value pair. This allows to avoid having to create an extra object for every entry put into the map. And it also tries to control the growth of the size of the array more aggressively. Since growing them only require copying the entries in array, not build, you know, rebuilding a hash map. Got you. So right. yeah, that's the difference. Okay, and when it comes to um, list, okay, what's the difference between a list and array types? Yeah, basically, uh, arrays have a static size. So when we define an array. We usually uh, we define their size at the time of declaration only, and that size is fixed. But a list is more like a like not more like a, it is a dynamic array. You can consider it where the size is not fixed, and it increases as the user you know adds more data into that. So it grows dynamically, but array has a static size. So okay. that is the difference. Okay, okay. And how do we know the size of a list? We can get it using you know list dot size. There is a method like the method of this list class dot size, which returns the size of the you know list. Nice. All right. Next question. Um, what are object expressions in Kotlin, and when should we use them? Sometimes uh, we need to create an object of some class with slight modification without explicitly declaring a you know new subclass of it. Java handles this with the anonymous inner class, you know, where you can just, we do not need to declare its name and you can just use the class directly. Kotlin uses the object expression to achieve the same functionality. We can even create an object expression for an interface or an abstract class by just implementing their abstract method. And it is often used as a substitution for the Java anonymous, you know, class only. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing, basically, anonymous scratch creation. Um, dun, dun, dun. all right, uh, dun, dun. okay, okay. And my next question is What are coroutines in Kotlin? Kotlin coroutines give you an API to write your asynchronous code sequentially. The documentation says Kotlin coroutines are like lightweight traits 
they are lightweight because uh, creating protein does not allocates new threads instead they use predefined thread pool and smart key protein right protein basically is a library like it is not available outside the scope of jet brains it is developed and supported by you know jet brains only it contains a number of high level protein enabled primitives including launch async and other right additionally protein can be suspended and resumed in the mid season this means you can have a long running task which you can execute little by little then you can pause it any number of times and resume it when you are ready again and it also provides functions like you know async and await like which is already provided by many other languages but here it's not keyword they are not even part of the mm-hmm. you know standard li- library of kotlin basically uh, it is provided by the jet prints only all right and my next question for you it's the last one okay what are the uh, disadvantages of using kotlin uh something that kotlin is a mess of extra syntax and keywords here are a few keywords which have non obvious meaning like internal cross line expect ratified sealed inner open like these keywords are very non obvious like java has none of these keywords kotlin is also amazingly inconsistent in its keywords like a function can be declared with a fun you know not complete function but an interface is declared with complete interface not just inter so you see the inconsistency also kotlin does not uh, have a checked exception check exception have become unfashionable yet many including me find them powerful a way to ensure that your code is robust finally kotlin hides a lot of what goes on in java you can trust through almost every step of program logic this can be vital for hunting it hunting down your bugs in kotlin if you define a data class then getters and setters like this get automatically created Okay, you do not have to add, like add them, and you cannot uh, add your debug statement in there because they are automatically created. Now this can be this could be bad sometimes. So those are some disadvantages. According to the docs, what Java has that Kotlin does not: check exceptions, primitive types that are not classes, static members, non-primitive fields, wildcard types, ternary operators like. you know so these are the things which java provides but kotlin does not provide so these are the few you know these advantages of kotlin as that said that's a wrap thank you raul uh, that was really nice to speak with you today yeah thanks it was nice to speak with you too to everybody else thank you for tuning in this mock interview series i hope you enjoy it as much as i did We will be back very soon with many episodes covering different tech stacks and language. And if you are looking for some specific mock interview, please consider and give it a thumbs up. And comment down below uh, with mock interview you would like to see in the upcoming video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Give it a big fat thumbs up if you enjoy this video. And till then, keep your learning spirit alive. I hope to see you in the next video. Take care.